Okay. I'd like to um, make a series of uh, short lectures on Plato's moral philosophy. But before I um, begin that, I'd like to say a few things about Plato, some preliminary observations so that we can orient ourselves towards Plato's thought in the proper way. So, um, first of all, perhaps I should give some of my credentials about Plato. i am uh, been a professor for over 40 years. I have a PhD from Penn State. Uh, they were ranked third in the world in philosophy. All my teachers were world famous. I've published uh, extensively on Plato and Greek philosophy and other things as well. Um, in, I've been widely cited uh, in journals. Uh, some people write uh, essays and put my, my name in the titles of their essays. I don't say that to brag. I just want you to know that I know what I'm talking about uh, when I when I talk about Plato. And I, I've been to Greece like seven times and, and uh, I've delivered papers, uh, essays at conferences. Uh, on uh, ancient Greek philosophy, some on Socrates and Plato, and I brush shoulders with some of the best Plato scholars in the world at those conferences, as well as at Penn State. Um, <clears throat> some of my teachers were, uh, were famous uh, ancient Greek scholars. So anyhow, I say all that because it's very important when you're uh, listening to someone lecture in philosophy, uh, there's no way of knowing if they know what they're talking about unless they, they give you the, some credentials at least. So, All right, so one of the things I wanted to point out before we even begin our study of Plato is um, it's, with Plato's philosophy, it, it offers some difficulties uh, in interpretation. Um, there's a, the only biographical, autobiographical, uh, writing we have by Plato himself on his own philosophy is called the seventh letter. And for years, the seventh letter was uh, considered dubious. Perhaps it wasn't Plato who was writing it. And then uh, some years ago, or oh, a couple decades ago, they found out this is actually uh, Plato's, it's legitimate. So Plato, we have Plato speaking about himself in this letter. So the letter is addressed to the friends and associates of Dion. Now, Dion was this person who lived in Syracuse, which is Syracuse, uh, which is the same name um, today in, in Sicily. Um, Sicily and all of Italy, all the way up to Rome in ancient times, uh, before the Romans conquered uh, the Western world, that was part of Magna Graecia, Greater Greece. So those, those were all Greek city-states, Syracuse, Syracuse was, was a Greek city-state. And Plato says in the seventh letter that he was destined to go into politics. His brother Glaucon actually did become a politician. But he said in that letter that his destiny was thwarted by, what, by the execution of Socrates. Now, Socrates didn't write anything. Socrates was about 40 years older than Plato, and Socrates was Plato's greatest influence. And Plato moved in the inner circle of Socrates. Socrates um, is like the first philosopher who philosophized about human issues. Now, philosophy began before Socrates. That portion of philosophy is called pre-Socratic. So important is Socrates that everything that came before him is called pre-Socratic. And there were these pre-Socratic philosophers. They weren't so concerned about the human condition as they were about metaphysics and physics. They were the first scientists. Uh, the, it was the beginnings of modern science. There was no set or ancient science. There was no separation between science and um, philosophy at that time and metaphysics, the study of reality. But with the appearance of Socrates, we have philosophy now turning to the human condition. But Socrates also thought about cosmology, cosmogony. Uh, cosmology is the study of the nature of the cosmos. Cosmogony is the, or the study of the origin of the, of the cosmos, um, of the universe. Um, but mostly Socrates was concerned about human issues, such, such things as morality. But other uh, 
at that time, all the disciplines of philosophy, the subdisciplines like logic, metaphysics, ethics, those haven't been separated yet. That happens later with Aristotle, who we'll study later. So in the seventh letter, Plato says that he's, his destiny to go into philosophy was thwarted by the execution of Socrates. So these 30 men took over the government, an extreme right wing uh, oligarchy. It was called the Reign of 30. They asked Plato and Socrates to participate, but um, they refused. And so they trumped up these charges against Socrates and they made it a stick and they actually executed him and he had to drink hemlock. And that was a great crime that the Athenians made against Socrates. Plato wrote a dialogue called the Apology, which is not apologizing about anything. The word apology can also mean defense. So Socrates is defending himself in court, and Plato wrote a whole dialogue showing that. So with the execution of Socrates, and then Plato also mentions in the seventh letter um, the, uh, the corruption in the laws and in the political structure of Athens, which, and uh, in the, the very characters and the mores of the people. So he realized that if he had gone into politics, he might be able to change this or that institution and make some minor changes, but it would be business as usual and things would remain the same. So he, he needed, he thought there would needed to be radical political restoration. And so he has this vision uh, and so politics was at the forefront always of his thought, but political philosophy, he has a vision of the ideal city-state, the ideal polis, and he thought that would be a republic, like we live in a republic today. Only Plato's republic is not a democratic republic. The Greeks invented democracy, but Plato was uh, not a, a, a fan of um, democracy. His republic is called an aristocratic republic, and he thought that there needs to be philosopher rulers, which is a strange thing that philosophers would rule this, the, the state. And so this letter, the seventh letter, is addressed to the friends and associates of Dion. Now this Dion is uh, a person who's inclined towards Plato's philosophy, and Plato thought that perhaps Dion could become one of these philosopher rulers, and he could put into practice his vision of the ideal state, this republic. And so one of the major dialogues of Plato's works is called the Republic. Um, but Three times he went to Syracuse to try to do this, and three times it failed because there was this tyrant who was in control there and wouldn't uh, allow that to happen. And so, um, in fact, the last time they assassinated Dion and incarcerated Plato, and Plato's friends had to come from Athens and spring him out of jail. So that was quite, but that tells me um, that Plato was serious about politics, about radical political restoration and politics was always at the forefront of his of his thinking the other thing that's important uh, i just want to say these things about plato so you can get oriented before we enter into this dialogue this symposium um, plato founded the first universities called the the academy that's where our word academy comes from and this uh, is the first university where he gave lectures and wrote these lectures. All these lectures had been lost. So the lectures were for his students at the academy. So that's important. And all we have of Plato's actual writings are these dialogues. We have, I think there's about 37, I never really counted them. I, th I think there's 37 bona fide dialogues that are um, known to be from Plato's own hand. They're the early dialogues, the middle dialogues, the later dialogues. Uh, he doesn't really date them. Uh, they were written in papyrus scrolls. They were found in a cave, you know, at, at a certain point. Um, and um, the, the style changes radically between the early, middle, and late. So that's how they divide them up. The Republic uh, is one of the largest dialogues. It's four books long. Um, and um, the Timaeus, it's a later dialogue about the origin of and the 
Nature of the Cosmos. That's a, a big one too, 10 books long. But um, we have these early, middle, and late dialogues, about 37 dialogues. Now the dialogues are just that, dialogues. So Plato has a background in playwriting. He was thinking also about being a playwright. And so he, he was trained as a playwright because the Greeks invented also theater, tragic and comic theater, which we've inherited from them. And so, um, but when Plato met Socrates, the story goes, he burned his plays and decided to devote himself to philosophy. And he was a disciple or the, the word disciple really doesn't fit with the ancient Greeks, a student and a friend of Socrates who never wrote anything. Now, Socrates then becomes the, the main character in all these dialogues. The dialogues are philosophical, but they are also very artful. They're like little plays, only not much happens in the plays. Well, what the big thing that happens in the early dialogues is Socrates is on his way towards execution. You, you, you see him in court defending himself. You, you hear him in another dialogue called the Crito, where he's... Um, his friend, his old friend Crito had paid the jailer off and so they, they could escape if they wanted to. The jailer would look the other way and Socrates has this dialogue with Crito and they decide that's not the, the right thing to do because the laws are, are should be not broken even though in that case they're not being applied prop, uh, appropriately, ethically. And there's all these dialogues that revolve around the last days of Socrates. But there are other dialogues in the early period that are not about the last days of Socrates, but um, that's the, the big backdrop behind the dramatic context of these early dialogues. <clears throat> so I wanted to talk about the dialogue form. I, didn't, I, I got carried away with the, these preliminary remarks, I guess. Um, but I, I do want to get you the proper orientation toward Plato so we don't just go flying off. So the other thing that I wanted to mention about the seventh letter is something he said about his own writing. Plato says in the seventh letter directly, uh, this is not a dialogue, this is a letter. So he, he's speaking directly, not indirectly. In, in the dialogue form, we need to talk about that. There's indirect communication. If somebody's just telling you directly something, then that's called direct communication. Okay, so he's saying directly in this letter to the friends and associates of Dion, but to all posterity, that um, nowhere have I written my philosophy down. Now, that, that's pretty big. He said, anybody who's written on my philosophy is either lying or joking. That's pretty big. I take that very seriously. Now, let's put that aside for a moment and add to that the fact that these dialogues are works of art. They're poetic. They're philosophical. Some of the best philosophy, Plato is like one of the greatest philosophies, philosophers we have, and perhaps the most influential of all the philosophers in the West, he and Aristotle. But there are other great ones too, and it does get better in certain ways. Uh, but Plato is like a giant right at the beginning. His dialogues are so great, no one even tries to write them after that. A few people tried, and they're paltry things compared to his. So he writes these dialogues. And what is a dialogue? Let's think about it. It's, it's an art form. It, it's like a play. You, and that's what's so wonderful about the dialogues. You feel transported to ancient Greece. I, that, I loved that when I was reading that. I thought, I mean, if you use your imagination and you read <clears throat> uh, the dialogues, you hear these people talking to each other, Socrates talking with his interlocutors, with the persons with whom he's speaking. And you're transported to ancient Greece because there's a dramatic context. So they're works of art. Now, anyone that knows anything about an artwork, there's not just one meaning to an artwork, okay? That doesn't mean that every uh, appreciator is, is, is having, every interpretation is, is a good interpretation either. It doesn't mean that. There are deep ones, shallow ones, you know, uh, legitimate ones, illegitimate ones, um, but there's not just one, okay? A legitimate interpretation of, in my mind, is one that takes seriously the intention of the author. So you want to get close to Plato's intention. That's going to be a, a little bit tricky. That's why I'm taking time to talk about this. With the other philosophers, 
it's difficult for other reasons. Philosophy is just difficult. Anything great is difficult. That's just how great things are. But for, they're difficult for other reasons. With Plato, there's an added difficulty, not only the depth and the distance that it is from us and the depth of thinking, but what, what's difficult is the fact that it's a dialogue. A dialogue is people talking to each other. So nowhere does Plato say, I, I, I believe this. He doesn't say that everywhere. That's why in the seventh letter he wrote, nowhere have I written my philosophy down. Um, and anyone that claims to have written on my thought is either lying or joking. Well, scholars after philosophy, Plato, they couldn't accept that because they, there'd be nothing for that. They felt there'd be nothing for them to say then. So Plato doesn't have a philosophy. Well, I don't go that far. But we do have to take into consideration that fact. And we have to connect it with the fact that the dialogues are art forms. So what do we do with these wonderful art forms? Well, first thing we want to do is get in the neighborhood of Plato's intention. How do we do that? Well, at the beginning, you need a teacher like me, somebody who's read all the dialogues. And what, what you do is you play one dialogue off the, the other. And then you take a passage. And then what you know about Plato in general, you can use that to shine light on that passage that you're trying to interpret. And then you move into the neighborhood of Plato's intention. But I never, in my publications on Plato. I never say Plato said this or Plato said that. So there's libraries full of, Plato is so big, he's like an institution. The libraries are full of scholarship on Plato throughout the world. Some are better than others, of course. Um, but the great Plato scholars, um, who I was lucky enough to be a student to, like Stanley Rosen, for example, at Penn State, they all, they all, know what I'm telling you now. And when I was brushing shoulders with some of the best uh, ancient Greek scholars in the world at these conferences in Greece, there was a small minority of people who took the dialogue seriously as artworks, and they were uh, approaching them in the way I'm, I'm suggesting. So what do we do then? Since you haven't read probably much of Plato. Well, listen to me, I have done that. I can give you some, but you can take one dialogue and you can approach it in such a way that you try to find your way to Plato's, Plato's intention. So uh, that's what I'd like to do. There's this wonderful dialogue that came from the middle period. It's called the symposium. Sim means together, posium means to place. That word has come into our language because of this dialogue. Also, there are symposiums on topics, you know, this and that. Usually, it's a group of people who come together to discuss some intellectual topic. But in ancient in, in ancient Greece, it 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 meant a drinking party, a dinner party, and then drinking afterwards. So the dramatic context of this dialogue which is one of the most beautiful and influential dialogues of Plato, is a dinner party and then afterwards drinking wine in celebration for uh, a, a certain person whose name is Agathon, who in 416 BC won the contest for writing the best tragedy of the time. The Greeks invented the contest that we've inherited. You know, if you think about, there are contests in everything. You know, I do dog sports. There's spelling bees that they're not to mention professional and amateur sports and some it, it just it, it's everywhere you turn right there's contests in schools we have sports and so on that idea of the contest the greek word for contest is agon a-g-o-n that's where we have words like agonistic antagonistic they invented the contest that's why the, invent, the, the Olympic Games are the best example. And um, there, there are two kinds of contests. Some contests are a bad egg on where the oppositions try to annihilate each other, like in war or unethical business practices where you make a monopoly and try to wipe out you know, every, everybody. But then there's another kind of contest where the contestants bring out the best in each other. If you go up against somebody who's as good as you, or better than you, or a team that's as good as you or better, it brings out the best. And the Greeks knew that. They, that's a, a kind of wisdom that the ancient world had. 
So if you, when you read the, the symposium, it's a little bit of a contest. Nobody says we're having a contest. Who can write the best speech on arrows? No one says that. But if you read between the lines or if you listen, read carefully, you hear they're trying, who's going to give the best speech on arrows? Okay. So we're going to try to extract the moral philosophy from this dialogue called the symposium. And we're going to try to move into the um, neighborhood of the intentions of Plato. And we're going to do that by reading the dialogue as a whole. And then if you take my hints, my pointers, uh, I'm going to go through the dialogue with some detail uh, with you. Maybe I'm thinking a series of lectures, not too many, maybe three. This one's taking longer than I thought. But um, I'll take you by the hand through the dialogue, and I'll point out places where you can extract Plato's um, moral philosophy from this. Now, this is, OK, so and then one more thing. Um, there are a, there's a bunch of secondary literature scholars who write books like this is Plato's theory of forms. This is Plato's moral philosophy. And it, I've read some of them, but I like I said, I take the seventh letter seriously and I take the fact that these dialogues are art forms seriously. And I play one dialogue off the off the other and I try to move in. So I think I can you you can move in the neighborhood of Plato's intention without saying Plato said this or Plato said that, because all we have are these dialogues and Plato disappears like an artist disappears. It'd be like reading Shakespeare's plays and then well what's plato's what's shakespeare's philosophy is it hamlet is it king lear is it it's none of those but when you read shakespeare you start getting you start moving towards his views on certain themes and you can move in the neighborhood of that so that's all i'm asking you to do and also when you since you're doing this at the formal level in college, think about the assignment. If you, I, I wrote the assignment in the uh, syllabus. I'm not going to give you a test on this dialogue. You're going to be able to select whatever you want from that in order to write an essay on Plato's moral philosophy. But I want you to be able to substantiate what you say. Usually in academia or in any intellectual enterprise, when we make arguments or when we speak, if, if you want to make a point, usually you, you need support for your point. I know if you watch politics or when you listen to some people, they, they make it seem that it's okay just to say things outright, that so-and-so is a, a horrible person or calling people names and things like that. But in academic circles, we don't do that. We make a point and then we try to substantiate it with some kind of good reasons. In logic, the point is called the conclusion. The good reasons are called premises. But, or even if you disagree with something, you can say what someone said, try to, I call that moment philological. You're trying to just say what some, trying to paraphrase or say in another, in other words, what somebody says. That's the philological moment. Um, then you may disagree. If you disagree, then say your disagreement, your critique, and then you have to give reasons why you disagree. But I'm not going to ask you to do that in this. I'm just going to ask you to if if you were um, uh, I have a sort of an imaginative uh, approach this time, and I think I'm going to hold on to this because it, it makes things come alive. In a let's say you were a student in Plato's Academy that, that now you're transported, you know, by a time machine or something to ancient Greece. And there you are at the first university in the Western world, in the world probably, because in the Eastern world and North and South of the world, there were no universities. There was wisdom and it was passed down from masters to disciples, but not the university. That's a, a Western phenomenon. You're at the first university and you're with Plato and he, he asks you, then what do you think my moral philosophy is? then what would you say? I'm just asking you to extract from this one dialogue, the symposium, some themes, maybe five solid themes that you think belong to his 
reflections on how to live, on um, human character and what is right, what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. Um, okay, now, so that's some preliminary stuff uh, I just wanted to say about Plato, because otherwise, you know, sometimes we just get off track if you don't, I mean, I, I said a lot in this little preliminary remarks about Socrates, he didn't write anything, he's in Plato's dialogues, and so on and so forth. Okay, now, the, um, so our purpose then is to extract some decisive dimensions of Plato's moral philosophy from just one middle dialogue called the Symposium. Now, the traditional approach to, uh, moral, to Plato's moral philosophy concentrates on the early dialogues, which form a kind of chain of dialogues, each on one moral excellence. That word is called arete, A-R-E-T-E, -E, with a little dash over the top of the E going from left to right. That's called arete, A-R-E-T-E. -E. And by the way, when you write any foreign word or phrase, just put it in italic print. It's just convention. Okay, so Arte is not, there are some words that come into our language that are foreign, but they like menu, that's like French, but you don't have to put that in italic print because it's become part of our English language. But there's some words like arte, for example, or eudaimonia, which means happiness in Greek or well-being. Then you put that in, in, Greek, in italic print. And then those letters that you use, like A-R-E-T-E, -E, that's called the transliteration. That's, the translation would be moral excellence. The A-R-E-T-E, -E, that's the transliteration, and that makes the same sound as the ancient Greek words, but it's for people who haven't studied ancient Greek, which is most people. And if you do it in the Greek, then you're using Greek letters. So, but you don't need to do that. Just put A-R-E-T-E -E and then yeah, italic print or any foreign. Also, since I'm talking about it, books, if it's a book or like symposium, that goes italic print. Um, if it's an essay, you put it in, in quotation marks. Okay. So the traditional approach to Plato's moral philosophy has to usually approaches it this way. These early dialogues all form like a chain of dialogues about moral excellence. And like, for example, there's one called the Lashes, and it's named after this great general. His name was Lashes, and it's all about courage. So Socrates goes up to Lashes uh, and asks him, what is courage? And they have this dialogue about courage. There's another one called the Carmides. It's all about sophrosyne in Greek, which means temperance, being able to control your impulses and desires. Uh, there's one called the Euthyphro. Euthyphro is a priest of ancient times. Socrates meets Euthyphro on the porch of the King Archon where religious trials were being held. Socrates is called there because he's being indicted for impiety. And Euthyphro is there for other reasons. He's taking his father to court for negligent homicide. And so they have this dialogue. Socrates asks Euthyphro, he, well, Euthyphro, I, I'm, I guess I'm going to have to defend myself in court for being impious. And since you're a priest, maybe you can tell me what is piety? Eusebia. Eusebia. Which is piety. Ti estin Eusebia in Greek means. What is the being of piety? What is the essence of piety? and they have this dialogue about piety and so that's usually the approach to morals and what plato what socrates is after is the idea see plato's philosophy is called idealism now that part is all legitimate plato believed that the highest reality is ideas our ideas so the idea of piety the idea of courage the idea of justice the idea of wisdom the idea of truth, not just this or that true thing, but the idea of truth itself, or the idea of beauty, not something beautiful, but whatever it is that makes anything beautiful be beautiful. What Plato thought was that, or what 
he learned from Socrates and why he's called an idealist is that the ideal is the real. The idea is what's real. These ideas exist not in the physical world, but in the intelligible region. They exist in God's mind. And so we can, using our intellect and using this dialectical approach, what do I mean by dialectical approach? Asking an ultimate question, let's say, what is love? Asking that ultimate question. It's not just any question, their ultimate question. What is truth? What is justice? What is courage? What is wisdom? What is love? And so on. And then entering into a dialogue with other people or with yourself. That's called thinking. But it's a dialogue. And that dialogue takes us higher and higher and we shed ignorance slowly, slowly. Every conversation we pick up where we left off or every thinking we pick up where we left off. And one day will come, Plato suggests, where we have insight, immediate intellectual intuition into the idea, and it's accompanied with this feeling of beatitude, with joy. And now you have insight into what is love, or what is beauty, and you're never the same. You're transformed by that insight. There's a transformative power of gaining insight into the ideas. So Socrates is always on the way towards these ideas, these ultimate ideas. Now words are, are cheap. Anyone can say love, beauty, Christian, Christian, whatever. But what Plato is after is the true meaning of these words. You know, have you ever noticed that? You know, all kinds of horrible things have been done in the name of Christianity. So that can't be what Jesus, you know, like race, to be a race, well, let's not go there. But all kinds of things can be attributed to words. What matters is what that word means. And what Plato's after is the true meaning of these words, the essence of these realities. So um, we're not going to approach it that way. This approach is very fruitful and it's edifying. But I'm trying to do uh, very brief little insights into seven uh, different philosophers in a, in a seven week course. So we don't have time to go through all these dialogues. I'd rather approach just one dialogue with some care and extract from it the moral philosophy. By the way, one more th preliminary thing before we move on. These dialogues are like little holograms. Each dialogue, th this is a unique the the dialogue plato's dialogues are a unique form of expression they're nothing like them in the history of philosophy they're philosophical they're artful they're dialogues they're like little plays but um they're also like little holograms each dialogue reflects the whole of plato's philosophy so if you master one you got the whole vision it's just not complete something can be whole but not complete so then you read another dialogue and there's the whole vision also but from another perspective, then you combine those two. Now you got a more rich and full understanding of the whole. Then you read another dialogue, and that sheds light on those other two. Then you now you have three, and as time goes by, you'll see there's one giant vision. It's like a, it's like a crystal ball with all kinds of facets, and it's Plato's uh, expression of his philosophy. Well, let me be careful, because I just said he never really expressed his philosophy. It's Plato's expression of his, his philosophy in the dialogue and the way he's suggesting that one should approach, approach his indirect communication. All right, so I don't mean to uh, turn you off to this whole approach, because it's, but, I, but it, uh, it, not knowing this uh, just leads us into blind alleyways. Okay, so rather than attempting to explain each point in this rich text, I'm going to instead offer a series of pointers indicating places in the dialogue where you can find passages that reflect Plato's moral philosophy. Um, and I want to um, define moral philosophy very broadly in this course as wisdom concerning how to live. Okay, it's advice or wisdom concerning how to live.
What about, um, let me just mention, um, I want to mention two more things in this brief dialogue. First, what is the rationale for this approach to take this one dialogue? Um, this unorth unorthodox approach to Plato's moral philosophy is not only legitimate, I think, but, um, but it's most beneficial as a way to discover what is it that provides a foundation and what is it that animates, that gives life to his entire moral philosophy. What lies at the heart of the question for Plato in all of the dialogues, even the most abstruse philosophical speculation about the nature of the cosmos even, is how should human beings live? And he means this on two levels. On an individual level, like you and I as individuals, but he also means it in a political sense. How should human beings live? What should be the structure of the state? So not only what should be the structure of the human soul, but what should be the structure of the soul writ large, that is the state. This, and he believed that a republic is the best form of government. So how should human beings live? That's the main question of all the dialogues. It may not be the one that's raised explicitly in the dialogue, but it's in the background of every dialogue. Since among all of Plato's dialogues, the symposium is all about what drives and what guides one to moral excellence, to arete, and ultimately to a life worth living. Since the symposium is about that, then it's a perfect place to gather together what lies at the heart of his thinking about morality. So, as we're going to see in so many ways, what lies at the heart of his thinking on morality is this driving and directing force of the human soul towards what the Greeks called the good life. And Plato's going to give a very explicit definition of what that is. You see people talking that uh, the good life, you know, um, that, that expression has also come down to us from ancient Greece. And we're going to see <clears throat> this sort of, um, we're anticipating this now, it's sort of a, uh, what do they call it about with film, a spoiler? But the force is going to have to do with the erotic, a spiritualization of the erotic drives of humans. That's going to be the force that drives one towards the good life and towards moral excellence and towards finally, a life worth living. The other thing I want to say in this brief um, introductory lecture on Plato's moral philosophy is I want you to get a, a sense of, um, see, normally, if you really want to make a, a reading your own, you need to read it three times. And I'm not going to ask you to do that because I know everybody's busy. And, but with the first reading, you just get an overview and read it fast. If you don't understand it, just keep on reading. Then read again, very slowly, very thoughtfully. And if you really want to make it your own, then you read the, a third time for style. And you can learn to speak and write well by listening and emulating the style of great writers. I'm not going to ask you to read things three times. So let me give you the overview first. Get us the structure of the dialogue. The dialogue begins with this introductory um, dialogue. What happens is um, there's this unnamed friend, this character, who asks a certain person, Apollodorus, I think his name is, um, what happened so many years ago at the home of Agathon? And this Apollodorus says, well, I wasn't there, but a certain uh, Euthydemus was, what's his name? Yeah, Euthydemus, I believe his name was. He was there, and he told me about it. So th there's things that take place in this early, this introductory dialogue where you can use, or you can find your way to Plato's thought a little bit. It's sort of like when you watch a movie, um, 
Plato was the first to do this, but like, okay, imagine like there's this old man and there's this little boy next to him and the old man is sitting on a rocking chair and the little boy says, Grandpa, like, were you in the Civil War? And he says, yeah, I was, son. Well, can you tell me what it was like? Uh, okay. And, he, and then the next scene, you see this young man marching off to war, right? That's the grandpa, right? So sometimes in cinema, they'll use this approach. Well, Plato's the first to do this. What, what he's doing is he has this one person talking with another person about something that happened way in the past. And then suddenly you're transported back to the past. So now the next, uh, so that's that introductory scene. Uh, so that's how it starts. Then uh, you're transported back to Socrates. Socrates meets this guy, um, a disciple of his, and um, they're on their way. Socrates is on his way to. Um, Agathon's home. He's he's invited there for a big celebration, a dinner party, and um, he's on the way there. They say things, and you know, the, the, and everything said. You know, you can use to try to find your way to Plato, the neighborhood of Plato's intentions. We're always needing to do that. But okay, so here's a, something that happens that's important. Socrates sends his friend there gets there early and wasn't even invited but they associate him with socrates and agathon says come in you know join the party now who's there well some of the major literati like aristophanes and eryximachus and there are these intellectuals who are there aristophanes is a famous comic poet he's there agathon is there he just won the prize he's going to have a big party celebration dinner party and so they invited Socrates, but Socrates doesn't show up in time. He goes off to a neighbor's porch and he doesn't come. They send messengers and ask him to come. And, and finally, Agathon tells his uh, Socrates' friend, why don't you go and get him? Or why isn't he coming? And, he's, and, that, and he says to Agathon, this is his way. Sometimes he does that. He goes off by himself and he just stares off into the distance. And then he comes when it, now, so one way of getting your, what does this have to do with Plato's philosophy? Here's an example of this indirect communication. If, if Plato were here, and this is, it sounds a little freaky to do this, but you could say to yourself, if Plato were here and I were to ask him, why did you have Socrates come late to the party and then finally show up? And then when he shows up, by the way, you're going to read, Agathon says, come sit next to me, Socrates, so that I can um, gain that wisdom that must have struck you in the, at the porch next door. And then Socrates says back, if only wisdom were that way, Agathon, that it goes from the full cup to the uh, empty cup. You know, like uh, um, some, you know, if you take some yarn and you put an empty cup down here and a full cup of water up here, the water will go down because of gravity into the other cup. And Socrates, that's not how wisdom tra is transmitted, to Agathon. So there's this bantering and, and jovial. What's so beautiful about the dialogue is there's this lighthearted, jovial attitude and the deepest thoughts at the same time. It doesn't have to be like Rodin's thinker, you know, with consternation. There can be a lighthearted, leisurely attitude uh, moving through life in a carefree way. And at the same time, as deep as it gets, you know, you can be deep and light at the same time. Serious thought need not be heavy and burdensome. So there's that tone you know, of the dialogue, which makes it very beautiful. Plato has this ability to make things look natural. And that's one of the qualities of great art when things look natural and, and they're actually being constructed by the artist. So um, how does that little incident, for example, tell us anything about Plato's moral philosophy. Well, Plato's depicting Socrates as the thinker and that he's living the good life. And part of living the good life is to give thought to life. The more thought you put to life, the better your life is going to be. That doesn't mean you always have to be reflecting. You're not spontaneous or anything. You know, you have to even give thought to how much, to what is, what it means to giving thought, right? Um, 
But it, it's been my experience that the more thought you put into life, the better it is. Not the more in terms of quality, but or quantity, but the quality of thinking. If you put some thought into life, you, it's going to be a better life, right? I mean, that's a no-brainer. So Socrates being depicted as the thinker. The good life involves thinking, okay? And not just cogitating either, but raising ultimate questions and entering into an inner dialogue. Now, this is atypical of Socrates, mostly when he's engaging in dialogue, as we're going to see from reading the dialogue, Plato's dialogue, is he's engaging in dialogue with other people. But you can do it by yourself. It's just better with other people because you have the freedom of the other to criticize what you're saying. And in order to move forward in your thinking, you need to think against yourself. And that's not easy to do when you're doing it alone. You reach a plateau and you just keep on thinking in circles. Um, not that thinking alone is worthless. I mean, you can think by yourself and enter into a dialogue with other thinkers too. That's another thing. But um, dialogue, uh, Socrates preferred thinking things over with other people because you have the freedom of the other to think, to criticize what you're saying that forces you to read, to move forward. So that little incident you can use to think about what Plato is saying about how to live. He's saying, if you want to live a good life, emulate Socrates, live philosophically, put some thought into life. And that's why he comes late to the, but he comes finally to, by that time they've, they've finished dinner and it's the drinking time. So that's, uh, that's still part of that early, um, that early uh, introductory dialogue. Then they decide they're going to all give speeches in praise of Eros. And they give speeches one by one. And that's what makes the dialogue so masterful. He goes through speech starts with Phaedrus, who we learn, you learn about these people from other dialogues. They become like your friends. I, I know there's another dialogue called the Phaedrus. Phaedrus loves speeches, and he's a, a student of classical, uh, of sophistical rhetoric and so on. Now you hear from Pausanias, you hear from Eryximachus, the great doctor, you hear from Aristophanes, and then you hear from Agathon. Okay, so just try to remember the structure of the dialogue. You have this introductory dialogue, and then it moves into, they're on their way to the home of Agathon. And then the things that are said is when Socrates shows up, and then they decide to give these speeches. Now they're going to give speeches, and the dialogue can be broken down into these speeches. And remember, it, it's not that hard. First, there's Phaedrus, then Pausanias, then Eryximachus, then um, Aristophanes, and then Agathon. Now it's Socrates' turn to speak. He changes everything. He says, well, um, I thought we were going to give speeches about the truth of Eros, but I realize now that uh, what you guys have been doing is just conjuring up all the highest ideas and projecting it into this god, Eros. And, uh, but I'm, I can't do that. I can't give a speech like that. Let me tell you what I learned from Diotima, this priestess, when I was a young man. And she initiated me into the mysteries of Eros. So the first part of Socrates' speech, he questions Agathon and enters into dialectics, which is very different from all the other speeches. Socrates' speech is so different. How is it different? He ends up, instead of giving a speech at the beginning, he questions Agathon. Now they're entering into dialogue. That's called dialectic, entering into dialogue with someone about some ultimate issue, in this case, Eros. By the way, Eros was considered a god in ancient Greece. It's a personification of the erotic drives, the desire to procreate and to find other people as beautiful and to want to procreate in beauty. So um, it's erotic drive. The that's what it means, desire, erotic desire. And they personified it and made a god out of it. So they're moving back and forth between this god, Eros, and this drive in humans, in all animals, all life, actually, the sexual procreation. 
you have, and you, you need to to make the importance of this. And most philosophers don't talk about sex very much. Uh, it's but uh, Plato did. Uh, they mentioned it, but for Plato, it's central uh, about the sublimation or the spiritualization of erotic drives. So that's what this. That's what I was calling this driving force, this directing force of uh, the human soul. So then you hear Socrates telling everyone what he learned from Diotima, and that's part of his speech, properly so called. And then he finishes his speech. And then the dialogue ends with um, a certain person, his name is Alcibiades. He's known for being so handsome and um, he was in love with Socrates and he comes and they say, well, you can, he crashes the party and he's drunk. He wants to come and put a wreath of ivy on the head of Agathon. Then he looks and he sees Socrates and he's, he's always been enamored by Socrates. And so they say, well, you, you and your friends can come to the party, but we're engaged in giving serious speeches on arrows. If you want to, um, come to this party, you're going to do that too. So now it's your turn, Alcibiades. You will have to give a speech on Eros. He says, well, I can't do that, but I can talk about Socrates. And so now this is important because um, the things that he says about Socrates have to do with Socrates' erotic drives. And what you learn from that speech of Alcibiades is that in Socrates, in Alcibiades' drunken speech about Socrates, uh, focusing on his erotic uh, dimensions, um, Socrates had practiced what he preached. So what he was preaching that he learned from Diotima, we learned from another, from Alcibiades, that that's how Socrates lived, that it wasn't just an idea that he, a theoretical idea, but that he lived the idea too. Okay, so that's the importance. And also you get a depiction, you get to know Socrates. Now that's an important point for Plato's moral philosophy because Plato is going to suggest, more than suggest, he's going to um, indirectly communicate to us that if you want to live a rich, full life, you need to live philosophically. So the next question is, well, what does it mean to live philosophically? And what is wisdom? Well, it means it means to emulate Socrates. Socrates is like the archetype of wisdom. Like in Christianity, Jesus is the archetype of, he's the, the, the cornerstone of, of uh, Christianity, right? There'd be no Christianity without Christ. So Plato is doing a similar thing with, so with Socrates. Socrates is like the archetype of the wise man. Now that doesn't mean you have to imitate him, he went around barefooted and so on. And uh, imitation and emulation are something different. Uh, imitation means you're just uh, slavishly uh, doing what other people are doing. Um, but you can emulate something where you take up the spirit of some, and live in a similar way, but all the uniqueness of your own self holds sway. Okay, so those are some preliminary thoughts on Plato's moral philosophy, and that's how I, we can approach it. There are so many ways. You can take any dialogue and extract the moral dimension from that dialogue. Be why? Because the main question is, how should man live? And that's the main question of morality. Um, every philosopher approaches moral philosophy differently. But, um, and so there are as many definitions of moral philosophy as there are philosophers, really. And some, and each one speaks as though their definition is the ultimate one. My own approach to things is more pluralistic. I like to uh, allow for pluralism. Everybody has their own views about it. But um, if you if you decipher what it is that's common among all this plurality of approaches to moral philosophy, it's the question about how to live. And I've always felt that. In life, you have some time, 
you've been given some time. We've all been given, every life form has been given some time. And humans can become aware of that givenness. And where does it start? It starts with your birth. Where does it end? It ends with your death. So there it is. That's your life span. You have that much time. Now, the next question is, how should I spend my time? You know, how should I be? There's so many ways to be. And I don't want to be in such a way that I get to be an old man, and then I have all these regrets and wish that I had lived differently. Maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should have done that. So one philosopher, and I'll leave you on this, Oscar Wilde, and I think somebody probably said it before him, he said, youth is wasted on the young. So why is it wasted? Sometimes I would start my classes with this question. I walk in class and ask the students that and take my time, take the whole first class. Why would someone say youth is wasted on the young? So in class, sometimes I would do that. And I would say, well, first of all, in, the, in order to find that answer to that question, we need to, under, to understand that stay, saying, youth, youth is wasted on the young. You have to think about the main elements of that statement, right? The youth wasted on the young. So what does it mean to be young? And then we went around class, you know, you have your whole life ahead of you. You probably look better than you're ever going to look. You know, you have all this energy, uh, it, you know, all these wonderful things about being young. Uh, you don't go bald like I am, you know, and so on. Uh, but then he goes on to say it's wasted on the young. So why is it wasted? So what's missing? And sometimes I would just ask the philosopher, uh, ask the I call it the schoolmaster's question when the teacher knows the answer and they're trying to get it from everyone. Uh, and then finally, someone will raise their hand. Wisdom. Yeah, that's the answer. What's mi what's missing with from most young people is wisdom. But it's a trick that life plays on us. By the time you get wisdom, you're old. You, all you can do is like make it, you know, <laughs> I don't want to go into a comedy skit, but you can, you know, it's like too late, you know. So how could you live in such a way that youth would not be wasted on the young? Well, gain some wisdom in some relatively young age. It's not impossible. You can get there early if, if you know where you're going, right? It's like when you're going somewhere, if you know where you're going, you get there a lot faster. So let wisdom be the goal of your education. And before you're an old person, you gain some wisdom. Just think of the life that you could make for yourself if you had wisdom while you were relatively young. You know, when you talk with old people, haven't they ever come up to, oh, don't waste your life, honey. You know, they're trying to, they're trying to tell you, uh, I, wish, I, I wish I'd known. You ever hear people say, I wish I had known now or then when I know now, then what kind of life I could have, you know. So you can take up this path of wisdom when you're relatively young. And philosophy, that's what the word means, the love of wisdom. So Plato's whole thing is going to be live philosophically, but we need to get inside of that and orchestrate it, it's sort of like Beethoven's symphony. Bum, 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 bum. Once you know that, okay, you got the whole symphony. But that's not the whole symphony, right? You have to enter into it and hear the orchestration of that. Bum, 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 dun, 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 bum, 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 bum. <laughs> okay, so that's some musings on uh, preliminary observations on Plato's moral philosophy. It's our approach. It's the way we're going to approach it. And uh, some important things about Plato that you need to know before you enter into the dialogue. Next thing to do is read the dialogue and have that structure in your mind as you go so you can, you know, so you can structure it that way. All right. So next time we'll go through the early speeches. All right.